Good evening. My name is Alexander Hagen, and I am the CEO of a small medium sized tech company in Silicon Valley. I'm a former financial analyst and financial journalist. That is my credibility. What I'm going to say tonight is not loosely researched opinion, but is double referenced indisputable fact. Let us start with Susan Rice, who is disgusted at China and Russia for not helping the United States in its plans to reshape Syria. All right, so let's listen to what Ms. Rice has to say precisely. The United States is disgusted that a couple members of this council continue to prevent us from fulfilling our sole purpose here. A couple, that's an interesting talking an point. Addressing an ever-deepening crisis in Syria and a growing threat to regional peace and security. For months, this council has been held hostage by a couple members. There she goes again, talking These for members a stand couple behind members. empty arguments and individual interests while delaying and seeking to strip bare any text that would pressure Assad to change his actions. Now, is why is that, that uh, they are taking a back seat in this particular case. So, let's see your more recent statement. Seen around the world, including in Damascus, right now. I want you to look into the camera as you are, and assume you're speaking directly to President Bashar al-Assad in Syria. Uh, what would you say to him? I'd say the United States stands with the people of Syria, uh, fully and unequivocally, in their aspirations for peace, as for democracy, stood with the people of uh, Libya. and for a brighter future. Your days are numbered, and it is time and past time for you to transfer power uh, responsibly and peacefully. The longer you hang on, the more damage you do yourself, your family, your interests, and your indeed, your family. family. Ambassador, thanks very much for joining us. Your family. Harm you do your family. Okay. <clears throat> very good. <clears throat> Susan Rice is disgusted at China and Russia, who she calls a couple of members. A couple of members. Twice in the one paragraph. I've been waiting for this showdown wherein you, Susan Rice, would try to do to others what you did in Libya. But you forgot one important fact this time. The Internet. We publish the truths that you have suppressed in previous disinformation campaigns. We've heard your remarks. Let us hear the remarks of the real news, because we know that Russia and China are hesitating to facilitate the United States and the West because they did exactly the same thing in Libya, and they got the shaft. And, dear reader, please bear with me, and I shall demonstrate this. Let's see here now. The shaft. Here we are. Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. Over the past few months at The Real News, we've covered many aspects of the Libyan war, mostly critical of the NATO intervention, which is clearly illegal and using humanitarian language to cover up imperialist objectives. If the mission had really been about saving Benghazi and not creating an even more compliant regime than Gaddafi's, there were ways to do that, which would not have resulted in so much loss of life. But the NATO agenda does not mean that the people of Libya have no right to overthrow a dictatorship. That's right. I do not at all uh, personally dispute and the fact that Libya was a dictatorship. And another thousands of ordinary Libyan people who want an end to the dictatorship. What the leadership of the rebellion turns out to be made of is yet to be seen. There are clearly some very shady characters, CIA-connected types, opportunists from the former regime, and so on. There may also be some legitimate representatives of the people. At any rate, it's not up to us. It's up to the Libyans. I think we should oppose imperialist adventures dressed up as humanitarian causes, and we should oppose dictatorships dressed up as anti-imperialists while pursuing neoliberal self-enrichment. Our concern, first and foremost, should be for international law. The UN resolution was a blank check to organize regime change in the interests of Anglo-American and French imperialism. The Russians, Chinese, and other governments on the UN Security Council didn't really much care what happened as long as they were not shut out of the oil post-war. Okay, so you can listen to the great Paul Jay uh, later. So let me return to my point. <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, 
I wonder who did craft Susan Rice's talking points this time. I recorded all of the lies that were made last time, the disinformation, in a document called NATO Intervention in Libya, the Washington Establishment Media Narrative, which I have posted on microtopia.org. The two, true disgust, in my view, in the world is with your lies. Uh, you hurriedly rushed through UN Resolution 1973. You conducted 25,000 aerial missions, dropping 10,000 payloads of munitions on an army the size of the New York Police Department, about 30,000. Libya has six to ten trillion dollars worth of oil, natural gas, and ice age water. Each soldier in Libya therefore guarded 200 million dollars in treasure a ratio that didn't work out very well for them with the West's invasion capitalism. Instead of competing with Brazil, Russia, India, and China, you intend to render them meaningless by penetrating them with your finance institutions, accumulating stock in their companies, as you allow us here in the United States to starve due to your huge military expenditures. Your administration's support of indefinite detention laws would cause the original 1775-76 revolutionaries in the United States to point their muskets directly at you, a far more virulent threat posed to us than the British against our forefathers, whose restrictions were mild in comparison to these modern conceptions. Also, I would like to point out the last time I heard somebody use the word disgust about opponent politicians, honestly, was when I was listening to a speech of Hitler's when he described Churchill and he said, it is with, I believe me, ladies and gentlemen, I feel a great disgust when I hear these irresponsible politicians. Interesting. Perhaps you have no personal stake in our founding as a nation. Perhaps you care no more for Jefferson than Hubert Humphrey. But many amongst us do. My family fought and died in the Revolution. Let us look at your behavior and compare it to Assad's. What was a proposal that you drafted that you used to overthrow the Libyan government violently, laying waste to their armed forces, annihilating their revolution, their customs, their culture, their laws? What will the consequences of your psychopathic arrogance be to our children, to my children? Ask the Africans what they think of your actions in Libya. Let's take a quick look. But before we do that, well, here we go. Outgoing AU chairperson slams West for disrespecting Africa. The African Union says no to the Libyan rebel leadership. Disrespected its peacemaking efforts disrespected, condemned Libyan's agreement with U European countries, disrespected the African Union, disrespected Africa. Just using the word disrespect alone produces these articles. There's many other words to describe it. <clears throat> and why do we not apply the same standards to Bahrain and Egypt <clears throat> that we do to Libya <clears throat> uh, and Syria and Iran? There are only three countries left in the Middle East that stand between us in total regional domination. What good will it do the Arabs to control the oil fields when we can simply change their governments at will? Can we compare your actions with Assad's? And if you find yourself wanting in the scales of justice, are you aware of how many capital crimes you have conspired in that you could be condemned to death 50,000 times over as 50,000 lost their lives unnecessarily due to your objectives? in real politic. To me, one of the most horrendous facts is that Libya was used as an advertisement for weapons manufacturers. Each NATO member took turns testing its readiness and weapon systems. Now, let us read the beginning of UN Resolution 1973 and see who should be disgusted. Right off the Guardian site. Acting under Chapter 7 of the Charter of the United Nations, demands immediate establishment of a ceasefire and a complete end to violence and all attacks against and abuses of civilians, stresses the need to intensify efforts to find a solution to the crisis which responds to the legitimate demands of the Libyan people, and notes the decisions of the Security General, Secretary General to send a special envoy to Libya and of the Peace and Security Council of the African Union sends ad hoc high-level committee to Libya, demands that the Libyan authorities comply with their obligations under international law. Now, I believe you will see that there is an arms embargo here. Let's see. A ban on all flights in the airspace of the Libyan Arab Jamahiriya. 
uh, uh, except in cases of humanitarian assistance. And believe me, if you go through this, there is a comp enf enforcement of an arms embargo. No side is to be uh, provided with arms. And no side is to have boots on the ground. That's what you in 1973 says, and you saw how the African Union thought they had been handled as an agent of peacekeeping. So let us see who should be disgusted. Now let us listen to Saif al-Islam al-Gaddafi, and let us also recall that I had my second strike on YouTube for this very video you're watching now, which I managed to find again on the internet. Lutte qui promet de bâtir une nouvelle Libye se dit ouvert aux négociations avec l'OTAN et les rebelles depuis plusieurs semaines. Vous voulez la démocratie On est prêts. You want a democracy done. You want election done. Vous voulez des élections On est prêts. Vous voulez quoi Une nouvelle constitution. Une nouvelle constitution done. On est prêts. Un cessez-le-feu. On est prêts. Mais vous refusez tout le temps. Let's have an election right now. That's what he said. Lots and lots of negotiation, eh? All right. The countries that you trusted, that trusted you and abstained, interestingly, I don't know if I can easily show it quickly or not. Uh, I think I can. Let's see if I have it here. Uh, I think I can. All right. Let's see here. Who voted for it? Who abstained? And so forth, right? Let's take a look if we can find them. Look at this. This is very important. B-R-I-C. The future powerhouse economies of the world. The countries my children are going to have to deal with that will surpass us economically between now and when my kids turn about 45. <clears throat> These four countries gave us the chance uh, and we abused it mightily. <clears throat> they watch you pulverize and slaughter the Libyan armed forces. Uh, armed jihadists to attack a secular government that had already send, surrendered its weapons eight years ago had paid compensation and settled the one incident in their 40-year history where the deaths of 300 were recorded. Consider in Iraq, from our embargo alone, almost a million children and uh, people died, and that their literacy rate fell in half. <clears throat> they were disgusted. You lost all credibility, Susan Rice. They saw your naked invasion capitalism for what it was. Strategic self-interest. How could you kill the equivalent in American terms, per capita, translated from Libya, of two million? If this had happened in America, two million Americans would have been killed by a foreign Air Force bombing, not from internal rebels. This was done by NATO. The number of people killed by the rebels was insignificant compared to the total annihilation of their police and their men and women in uniform. People whose only crime was defending their nation. If this had happened in the United States, currently we would have 500,000 people being tortured simply for having supported their government. There's 8,000 people in prison being tortured in Libya now, about 100 times as many as were in the previous regime, about 80 a year. If you can go through the Amnesty International reports yourself, if you don't believe me, in some years there were only three or four cases cited. Of, uh, of repression. That doesn't mean we know the ex full extent, but it certainly was nothing compared to what we've got now. We've got a hundred years of Libyan torture cases occurring right now this month. <clears throat> this is what we've done for Libya so far. And no, no other of these people, some of them could have been very well born under the 1969 revolution. They, uh, would we torture North Koreans for having supported their dear leader? Would we have armed Islamic extremists to torture the North Korean supporters? And in the case of Iran, let us take a look at a map. Here is a map. Now, Oman and Yemen are falling quickly in the U.S. orbit. I believe Oman already is. Of course, Kuwait is. I didn't listen here because this is based on recent arms sales. But if you look at Iran, 
Turkmenistan has American overfly rights and troops. So does Uzbekistan. We are in Afghanistan. We're in Iraq. We're in Turkey. We're in Saudi Arabia militarily. They're a proxy. Jordan, Egypt, all of these countries are client states, the United States, and now Libya. Look at Iran. It's completely surrounded. Imagine what the impact would be of an arms embargo, I mean, of a food embargo on Iran. And in the case of Syria, entirely encircled as well. Libya has already fallen. <clears throat> if you were Iran, wouldn't you consider the nuclear bomb absolutely indispensable to your survival at this point? If you were the Iranian leadership, your first priority would be to secure nuclear weapons, so you would end up like North Korea and not like Libya. The main regret of Saif al-Islam was that Libya gave up their weapons of mass destruction and surrendered them to the country that then invaded them and slaughtered his family. You even issued a veiled threat just now to Assad's family. I hope my, our viewers noted that, that, it's, uh, that his family could be endangered by this. When you consider the attempt to exterminate the entire Gaddafi clan, their clan elders were murdered by the Islamic extremists we armed. Three of the seven children of Gaddafi were murdered uh, by NATO. Nieces and nephews of the survivors were murdered by NATO. We bombed their television station and killed their journalists. And Saif al-Islam would, of course, be dead if the people who now hold him, the people of Zintan, did not consider him a useful bargaining chip. The man who led the effort to free the very people who lynched his father and then desecrated his corpse. The poor old deluded fool, Gaddafi, died, still believing in Obama, apparently. You can also Google that. Who stood by mutely and watched the idealistic, bullying founder of modern Libya, butchered by the very group who had ethnically cleansed black Africans in Tawerga, the Mizratra brigades. Obama... African bombing abomination and conducted by a repellent lying troika of Susan Rice, Hillary Clinton, and Anders Fogg Rasmussen. For me, your teeth drip with the fresh blood of Libya as you demand to sick your teeth now into the flesh of the last socialist country in Europe and the Middle East, with the exception of Algeria. Do you think double-crossing BRIC, Brazil, Russia, India, China was a smart idea? Do you think they are cynical enough or foolish enough to keep allowing you to use military force instead of mutual respect and diplomacy? If you want to intervene, seven million died in the Congo. Go there. Go to somewhere that's not full of treasure if you want to show your concern for human life. And what about here in the United States? What about the life in the United States? 20% of people that are on poverty in poverty. If you study poverty in the United States, you'll be horrified. Why don't we concern ourselves about the humanitarian issues here at home? We're having four times the incarcerated population of any other country in the world other than perhaps uh, Somalia, a country like Saudi Arabia and one or two others. In fact, I think we have, the, we have two million prisoners more than anybody else, as I've mentioned many times before. Yes, it is a moment for disgust, Susan Rice. Disgust that you could be so brazen as to dare to claim moral authority in intervening in these countries. You have no moral authority. Let BRIC conduct these negotiations, not your puppets. In other words, let Brazil and Russia and India China intervene and have talks. Since they haven't been invaded anyway in the last 30 years, their teeth are not covered in blood. With Russia being a little bit more to the uh, violent side in the last 30 years. But nonetheless, it pales in comparison to the United States. Why do you support autocrats in the Gulf, Obama, Rice, and the military-industrial complex? Because they are like heroin addicts. A little nudge from our CIA and our Pentagon and their precarious anachronistic monarchies with no basis in terms of bloodlines before World War I when those monarchies were installed by the British after the defeat of the Ottoman Empire. They will fall easily. All you have to do is give them a little t uh, push. Such pawns, so easy to control. Answer these charges before daring to allow such words to drip from your bloodthirsty, rapacious, hungry mouth. And remember, the standard of living fell in Iraq enormously. All measures of human development fell. And in Libya, it is not forecast to recover its economy from pre-NATO bombing levels until 2018, when it had a growth rate of over 10%. You have cut their economy by two-thirds. Here are 11 questions that you have not answered honestly. If, as most analysts show, the sitting Libyan government was more widely supported than the rebels, does that not destroy the whole basis of this violent intervention? How do we know the NTC had any 
legitimacy. How do we know that the majority of Libyans uh, were opposed to Gaddafi? What do serious analysts believe would have happened if the Libyan government had reoccupied Benghazi? Perhaps a few hundred deaths when we killed 50,000. In terms of civilian casualties, the number would have been quite low. And Susan Rice damn well knows this. She claimed tens of thousands of lives were saved. This is utter deceit. It makes me want to vomit. What impact will this invasion have on the psychology of the adolescents and children in Libya? Libya was one of the most peaceful countries in the world. You were one-eighth or one-fourth as likely to die violently in Libya on any given day than in the United States or Britain. Why have you ignored the ceasefire provision? How can you bomb while the rebels refuse to negotiate? Of course they'll refuse to negotiate as long as you're bombing for them. A NATO representative said their violent peacekeeping mission can kill Libyans with impunity as long as the person they kill has a gun. In other words, the armed forces don't count against the miraculous casualty-free warfare you claim you've engaged in. Do you have any evidence that the majority of Libyans support your bombing and drone campaign? What is your response to the Amnesty International and Doctors Without Borders reports that refute all of your claims that were used to justify you in 1973? There was no evidence of rape, no evidence of mercenaries, no evidence of heavy weapon use on civilians. But there's evidence of all that now, after the revolution, by the people that you have armed. Heavy weapons were used in Abu Salim and Tripoli, according to the New York Times. That was by the people we armed against people that had supported their government that we overthrew. <clears throat> How do we have moral authority to determine Libya is a worse country than our own when they have no homelessness, no food insecurity, and a poverty rate one-third the United States? And why has the U.S. been the only country to invade anyone in the last 20 years? Why can others use diplomacy and we can only stand, understand violence? Why will no one in the press directly confront these questions? We want to show Arabs we support their aspirations. How does saturation bombing Libya likely appear to them? Why are we arming militants to destroy a secular government? Jihadist militants, the very people that we claim that this entire fiasco of war on terror is based on. You have attempted coups or sabotaged economically just amongst country, uh, the very few countries that are left in the world that don't allow international super capitalism to control their economies and you are pushing all of them to fall. You tried to make a coup in Bolivia under Bush to overthrow Evo Morales. There was an attempted coup in Venezuela against Hugo Chavez, which the U.S.'s fingerprints are all over. We mined the harbors of Nicaragua under Reagan against the U.N. and the International Criminal Court. We attempted to kill Castro and have put an, ar uh, an embargo on Cuba that probably made their government more hardline. The same with North Korea. Uh, this and a few socialist countries remain Burma, Syria, and of course, all of these we put intense pressure on. There's only a handful of countries that comprise less than 5% of the world's GDP. They may have large armies, but they're obsolete with our drone technology and our ability to wipe out all air defenses. They're, these countries are utterly powerless against a military which represents 75% of the world's arms expenditures. Only one country remains in the region of the socialists that you have not tried to destabilize and pressure. Algeria, when will its turn come? These countries, the simple fact is that the people that put you in your fancy office, surrounded by your staff and your armies and your soldiers and your politicians and your billionaire buddies, your billionaire boys club, they all are under pressure to grow their companies and grow their empires. And new states with new markets are oh so easy to make big profits from, according to invasion capitalism, particularly the media companies who profit from the viewership of these wars and sell ads to the companies that make the arms and are invested in by the same groups that invest in Boeing and Raytheon and Kellogg Brown and Root and General Dynamics and Lockheed Martin and how many alumni of the CIA and the Pentagon and the Congress now benefit from incomes from these power structures called arms makers. Americans, Obama sold you out. He will go back to his changes uh, we can believe in rhetoric for the election and then wheel and deal suspending the concentrate the Constitution concentrating power once it is over and then once he has left office he will join the billionaire boys club just like Clinton and live a cushy life and accumulate millions and millions and millions of dollars this is Alexander Hagan 
Thank you. Vote for Ron Paul. He's the only honest man in the election. Why on earth would anyone support a man who had been born with a silver spoon in his mouth like Romney, who worked in private equity firms, which are big, the biggest threat to our economy in many ways? I, I support people that work in business and invest honestly, but I don't support corruption, and there's a lot of it going around. Thank you.